pressure you feel might be different to the pressure I feel. What Dame feels could be different to both of what we feel. Identify what it is, and then what are we? What's your plan? When you start feeling that, what are you going to do? Because when you, if you don't have a plan, and you're feeling it, you're gone. Steve, thanks for joining us. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure, and looking forward to it. Uh, let's start then with the the question that I guess defines the name of this podcast. What is your version of high performance? Well, I guess it's uh, it's a number of things really. But if you if you're looking at skill, it's it's being able to perform the skill at the highest level under the most pressure, and keep your your mental fortitude in the now as opposed to in the past or being distracted by what's going on around you and. Um, you know, off field, it's about making sure that you're doing the little things that make you better. You know, so we often, I think, understand the on field stuff, but we struggle a little bit with the off field, particularly young athletes when they start, and that's where we have to educate them a bit. And where did your own personal desire to find high performance to improve yourself and those around you begin? You know, I think when you start doing things and you don't do them as well as you'd like to do, then you find ways to get better. And if you want to win things and you don't win them, you find ways to get better. And it, it grows within you and, um, you know, it's like something's just tapping away in the back of your head all the time, demanding that you you got to front up. And I was lucky in my early coaching career, I, I, um, I came straight out of playing and went straight to coaching. And I had a, uh, a coach who'd been a teacher, uh, a coach, you know, for all his life and, he taught me something that stayed with me forever. You know, after the game and you haven't won or you haven't played as well, it's not about what the guys haven't done. It's what what could you do better during the week to help them be better? And he said, that's the question we've got to ask ourselves. So that stuck with me and you know, I think that's been wonderful help. So I'm the son of a coach as well. My dad was a boxing coach, Steve, and um. I think sometimes in this modern day and age, we often overcomplicate a lot of the messages. And I think common sense is common practice and it goes right the way uh, back. Don't well, get me going on common sense. <laughs> Go on. Well, it shouldn't be called common sense because it's not that common. Um, the job of the coach is to take something that's complex and complicated and make it simple. The simpler you can make it, the easier it is for you know your athlete to be able to go and do it. If you've got athletes who have got to think about what they're doing, then it doesn't matter what sport it is, they're going to be slow at it because they're too busy thinking rather than doing. You know, I always say, like, you drive your car, you don't think about how you drive it. You just drive it until someone either cuts you off or you just about have an accident. And the next 15 minutes, you know, you're the sweat coming off the brow because you're thinking that much. But you're not going very fast. And, and it's the same. Like in our sport... Continually, we overcoach them. We over comp, uh, complicate things that should just be simple messages. So it sounds simple to say, make it simple. Mm. How did you do it? <laughs> Good question. Well, I think over time, come to understand uh, for the game I wanted to play and the players I had to play it, I, I wanted to find right what's critical. And uh, I, you can't have too many. There's a lot of important many things, but what's really, really critical, if you know we do those really good, we'll give ourselves a chance to win. So identifying those, and then for each one of those five things, you find two or three things that are really critical for them to be successful. What were the five? Uh, for me, uh, set piece, uh, breakdown, tackle, catch and pass, and then individual, you know, position specific skills like kicking for fullbacks and stuff like that. So, so where among making the game of rugby more simple comes the culture, the the messaging to the players, getting to their heart, not their head. How do you make all of that simple? Because the people that listen to this podcast are constantly looking for ways in their own lives to to do that. Yeah, well, culture is probably the most overused word in the. In the planet, I think, because it's it, is there a culture or is it just how you live? And and so once you establish how you want to live and then you go about living it from the top down rather than the bottom up, um, things are either going to be great or they're going to be dog shit, you know, because there's only two types of way to live. It's either right or wrong. 
So it's a matter of establishing what's not negotiable, what is negotiable, and then um, getting aligned on it. So from my point of view, it was making sure the other coaches, the management were aligned. Then we'd take it to our leaders, get them aligned, and give everybody the opportunity to disagree and, and robustly discuss it. And eventually someone may still be disagreeing, but they have to commit to it because the majority wins. Then you take it to the rest of the group and give them the same opportunity. So we all own it. It's not just Steve's idea. It's everybody's idea right down to the guy that's just arrived first time in the All Blacks. And his his opinion is just as valuable as everybody else's. So give them the opportunity to, as I say, robustly disagree or, or agree. At some point, boys, okay, well... We've still got a 23 split here. What are we going to do? And, you know, obviously the 20 are going to outvote the three. So you guys coming with us, and that means if it works, you get the credit. If it doesn't work, you can't sit there and go, well, I told you it wasn't going to work. We, we're all in it together. So we disagree and commit to it, and you know, that's been the philosophy for a long time and, and then living it from the top down, I think, you know. It's really, really important. So what were the non-negotiable expectations that you did set then? Um, the first one was team first and individual second. I um, always felt that I wanted to care about my athletes, um, but I didn't want that care and love and support to get in the way of making tough decisions. So if I made the team more important than the individual, then the team would demand that I'd make those tough decisions. And if we could educate our athletes and our management to understand that as well, then we'd all make the right decisions in the in the moment that we needed to make them because it was more important for the team than it was for myself. Now, we didn't get that right all the time. You know, there's guys, uh, they're young men and they make mistakes, but you know, we got it right a lot of the time. So that was non-negotiable. Uh, having alignment was non-negotiable. So we couldn't do it if we didn't agree that we had to be aligned. And then the third one was that the players would drive that alignment um, from a standards point of view and, and uh, well, they would lead it, sorry, not just drive it, but they would lead it both on and off the field. You know, I, I wanted them to drive the bus as opposed to me being the driver. I love what you said there about caring about players because I think – Often people assume elite sport is quite a brutal, harsh environment, and yet to hear somebody as successful as yourself talk about caring and wanting to get along with players is important. Would you explain for those outside of that world then that maybe would be surprised at hearing that, why it is so important? Well, it's a tough job, as you've just said. You know, It's a really, really uh, mentally pressured uh, environment and... You know, human beings, just by nature, want to be loved. Like we all want to be cared, we want people to care about us, we want to be valued. And uh, when I started coaching, I, I always, um, I'm, like I'm a reasonably simple person, so I'd always use well, the philosophy of my own career and things that happened to me, the good and the bad, and you know, the bad things I didn't want to happen to other people. Like people not being brave enough to, to tell you the truth about selections not being honest enough to say where you sit in the pecking order, not caring enough to be able to say, well, look, you know, you don't need to be here today. You go and sort out what's happening at home. So uh, I just naturally took that into, you know, and over years you refine it and you get better and you grow as you have more experiences. So I just think it, whilst it's really important the team comes first, your team's made up of a whole lot of different people who have different things going on in their lives and need support. Some need a kick in the bum and some need a cuddle. But, you know, no one's ever been hurt by giving them a cuddle, have they? It's an interesting one, isn't it, this caring for people, because it's the right thing to do. Mm. But your job actually at the end of the day is to win games of rugby and win trophies. Mm. So can you give us an example of when you knew that caring for individuals actually translated to performances on the rugby pitch? Oh, there was no light bulb moment that said it. I just knew that that's how I wanted to coach. And um, when I did it, I knew I'd, I had an athlete who would give me more. 
So I guess that, that maybe that was the light bulb moment, I suppose. But the more you knew the athlete, knew that you cared about them and you trusted them and, and you were able to be vulnerable enough with them to share things and normalise things, uh, the more they would give you. Can we talk about alignment as well? Because that's something that's come up in the conversation three or four times already. I think we all learn more when things aren't going right than when they're, when they're going well. Could you give us an example of a period in your coaching career when you have the alignment has not been right and it's you've had to oh, there's two deal with times it. probably uh, the alignment wasn't right with the process and it was my fault because I became too outcome and um, focused. When was that? Uh, one was my second year as a Canterbury coach. We'd won the competition the first year and you know, we're away flying and. Um, you know, I, I got so demanding because I wanted to win again that it got in the way of actually caring about the athlete and, you know, came across as a prick really and didn't care enough and value them enough and started missing things because it was all about winning. And probably the, the last time it happened was 217 and uh, Lions Tour. Again, because I really, really wanted to win that. And it became more important than actually doing what was right, uh, you know. But you recognise it, and both times I went back to the groups, the two different groups, and said, "Look, I've stuffed this up, and this is what I've done, and apologise, and you know, let's start again." So, how do you avoid complacency then? Because that's a really interesting challenge when you describe that first year at Canterbury, like winning, and then wanting to win again, but without wanting to compromise your values? Yeah, I, I think it's about setting up a, a blueprint that you can um, go to when you're successful. So for us, we we had five things. We had, a, if you thought about them in columns, first column was about who we were, what's our identity, what's our legacy, and I'll come back to them. And the second one was about how fast can we learn every day about what's going on, not just in our game, but in, you know, take information from all over the place. Third one, well, what are the inconvenient facts that we're prepared to admit to ourselves out loud as opposed to, you know, wallpaper, uh, paper over the cracks? Um, fourth one was how fast can we adapt and adjust in games when things aren't going the way we want them to? And the last one was, okay, what's the big audacious goal that we're going to try and achieve um, so we sat down um, and tried to identify what they were and it was interesting because when we went to the identity and it was a word that we'd used a lot, you know, our legacy, et cetera, et cetera, and, and I asked in a leaders meeting and it was, um, I think there's 12 players and about four management and we couldn't answer it as distinctly as we wanted to. So I said, right, oh, well, we have to find out what that is. So what we did was we uh, interviewed every living All Black, past and, and current, and asked them what were the values or the core things they saw that made them cherish the All Blacks. And we came up with a series of, of things, and then we put players, attached players, into those different areas from the past, uh, and that so okay, that's what we're representing. So that's what we have to deliver on every day. Um, we went to the inconvenient facts and admitted to ourselves, right? Oh well, let's look at the teams we're playing. What are they as good as? You know, they'll be better at some things than us. They'll be the same as us at some things, and then they'll be not as good in some things. So we've got to stay in front of them in this area, catch up here, and try and get ahead of them here. So they are things you do every day and that allows you to not just concentrate on what you've just done. So it's bigger than that. And then the, and the, your big audacious goal, like ours was when I first got the job, we just won the World Cup in 2011 and I had to go to this interview and I'm, you know, I'm thinking, well, what am I going to say to them? You know, like we're number one in the world, so I can't come and say, well, we're going to be number one in the world and I'll go, we already are. And I looked like a dick, so I, and I, I thought about it and talked to Tash, my wife, about it a lot. And, and then I came up with the idea of, okay, well, let's be the 
greatest sports team in the history of the game. And then once we had that established, what I wanted to do was be able to say what that looked like and would feel like. So I came up with these ideas and anyway, that's what I said to the board uh, when I went for the job. They gave me the job. But then I took it to the team and did what I was talking about before, give the management a chance to rip it apart and and they, they all had a crack at it and but they liked it enough to keep it the way it was. Then we took it to the leaders and they, they liked it and uh, then we took it to the young guys and they all liked it. So it basically stayed the same. But what it did do was it moved people's asses from being comfortable in the back of the chair to the front of it. And I, I don't even know if some people thought we could we could achieve it. And I don't know if we did or we didn't achieve it. It doesn't matter. What what mattered was we had a whole group of people collectively owning that idea, trying to achieve it. And, you know, as I said to the group, it doesn't matter what whether we achieve it or not, guys. It's what the public it's the story we leave behind. They'll tell us if we've achieved it or not. And, and, you know, like you're only going to achieve it to have to do it again. So it's never ending. And then we would set, you know, immediate goals for up and coming competitions and then mid term goals. So, as an example, like when we come here in 2015, the World Cup, one of the goals we wanted to do was become the second most supported team behind England for, for the English fans. Because if they got knocked out, who were England going to fans support? And we thought, well, why can't they support us? It'd be nice to come to Twickenham for a change and have them shouting for us. So everything we did off the field had that in mind. And again, the boys all bought into it really well. And you know, by the time we did get here, we did have a great fan base that was English based. Well, there was that lovely moment one day after you won it, where that, I mean, what you've just said makes perfect sense when Sonny Bill Williams gave the. Gave the young yeah, trespasser, the, yeah, gave yeah. him his medal afterwards. Yeah, that yeah. You can he wasn't see really it. a trespasser. He was just a sports keen fan, wasn't he, really? Yeah, yeah. I got over the top a wee bit about the trespassing, I reckon. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we just, we, we, you know, common sense again, we just forget the moment. That this is an important moment for that child, even that adult, you know, like they've just witnessed something that may keep them in the game forever or actually make them come back to the game. So, we shouldn't get too heavy-handed with them. That's the magic thing about sport. But sometimes for people, and you would have seen this throughout your career, the the size and the scale of something can derail people. Mm. Would you truly take us inside what life is like when you take on the All Blacks? Because there can be very few sports teams where the pressure is, is similar. Yeah, well, that's, uh, the pressure's the, the, the word. It's the one constant. It's, you, you, you know that. And we would talk about it a lot uh, during my time and every time we'd come back together, we'd, we'd talk about it. We'd go, right, oh, well, the one constant thing we're going to get here, guys, is pressure because we're going to be scrutinised. But don't be frightened by that. Actually embrace it and understand that whatever the external pressure is, we'll have an internal pressure that's even higher. So, so therefore, the, that external pressure can't touch you. Right. So if someone, you know, like we lost in 07 in uh, France and uh, in Cardiff, and people go, you know, some, they don't know what to say, but they say some stupid stuff. Oh, yeah, really. Geez, it really annoyed me when you lost that game. And I said, well, what do you think it did to me? You know, like I'm annoyed too, pal, you know. He said, oh, yeah, but I had to fly all the way over here. I had to fly all the way home. And, and they sort of get it, but they don't get it. It's because they love the game and they love the team and you don't want – that's why you don't want it to change. Yeah. You want that people to be there really rooting for your team because it's a hard job when they're not. But you need to understand it's there. You need to have to admit to yourself it's there. And then you can put some plans around it. So what, what you, pressure you feel might be different to the pressure I feel. What Dame feels could be different to both of what we feel. Identify what it is, and then what are we? What's your plan? When you start feeling that, what are you going to do? Because when you, if you don't have a plan, and you're feeling it, you're gone. You're not going to pull it out your backside and say, "Well, I'm going to do this now," because you're not. You just can't. What sort of plans would you put in place then for 
Because obviously, some players would thrive under pressure, and we've all seen, you know, players. Yeah, but who they thrive help. under pressure because they're prepared for it. Right. It's not. It's not the pressure that's making them thrive. It's yeah, the course. preparation that's making them thrive. And they've planned for. Okay, when this gets hot, and and you know, it's tug of war sort of time in the in the heat of the game, they're not worried about the scoreboard. Their plan is forget the scoreboard. Their plan is to stay right here where my feet are. Stay in the now. What's the job I've got to do? Let's do that job as really good as I can and hope like hell the, the guy across me, he's worried about the scoreboard or he's worried about the mistake he's just made. And I think that's the difference. So having those mental skills, like for a long time the All Blacks didn't want to admit to ourselves that we were chokers at World Cup. And, and um, the reason we didn't is because the people at the top – didn't have to own it because you got the sack. So the next guy coming in, well, not my fault. I didn't choke, so I'm not a choker. But in 07, we got the opportunity to do it again and, you know, we had to sit there and say, well, shit, what, what are we going to learn from this? What can we take out of this pain and put it into a wee parcel that's going to make us good? We won two World Cups because of the fact that they allowed us to have another go. And we took the learnings and, you know... Um, Bob's your uncle, SpongeBob got there and got the job done. So what were those learnings? All about pressure. We have to admit to ourselves that there is a lot of pressure. So how are we going to deal with the fact that we haven't been in a final before? How, you know, what, we're, what is that pressure doing to each of us individually that we haven't been there before? Um, so we walk towards it. Things are going to go wrong. So what are, they, what are we going to do if they do go wrong? I, I don't know if you remember 11, but we lost more first fives than... Most teams have hot dinners, so, um, you know, we, it's like we're getting taken out by pineapples all the time. That's the second word I had to use too, by the way. I've got two in. <laughs> um, for the for the listeners, I've got three words to get into this What podcast. was the first one? Was SpongeBob. Ah, well done. <laughs> Just for, to set the context for people listening to this, uh, Steve's got his family with us and they've set him um, a challenge for three words in the interview. Right, we'll, we'll see if us... SpongeBob, pineapple. We'll see if us and the viewers can... Uh, can, yeah. can spot the third. Anyway, sorry to take away from the importance of no, it. No, it's, it's, this is really interesting. I think what's really good for people is you know, specific things that you've done are so nicely transferable to whatever life our listeners are living, you know? Yeah, well, I think that's right. Like, we get into trouble because we, we don't expect some things to happen, so we feel threatened by it. And then we either get aggressive, fight, flight or freeze, which we've all, we all understand that term. We don't know how to deal with it. And, and the, the simple thing is we go there every day. We, we, something will threaten us that we didn't expect. So the more things we can plan um, that might happen that we don't want to happen, the better we'll be off to react to it when it does happen. Does that make sense? Mm, yeah. And, you know, that... That can't take you away from what we want to happen. So this is how we want to play. This is what we want to do. This is what we want to achieve. Okay, so we've got that and we've, we've spent our week making sure that we've got clarity, we add the intensity and in once we've got that clarity and then we add the, you know, the, the, the accuracy, right, okay, we're ready to rock and roll. But have we taken any time to think about, okay, well, what if we don't get that? Where are we going to go? both individually and collectively. So we would spend a lot of time, we used to call them what-ifs. So what if this happens? And, you know, the, most of the time it was pretty successful. See, what I find fascinating on that is because it makes perfect sense, but it challenges, again, this this notion outside of that world of thinking that everything's got to be positive, that you can't a- allow room for the negatives in. Particularly this generation, I think, of uh, Z generation, they like the world to be positive. But they also like to have an opinion and they also like to voice it. So, okay, we'll give them that opportunity to do those things and have and take some ownership of it and, okay, what does positive look like? Okay, well, now what's going to happen when we don't get that, boys? We can't go all howly belly and say, well, we don't want that. Yeah. You know, <laughs> opposition ain't going to stop. And, and it, it's a... Look, I look back at the 19 World Cup and the hardest thing to do at World Cups, this is why they're so hard to win, is go back to back to back. You've got to have three great performances to win it. 
if you're in a draw on the side of the draw where you've got real big opposition. Like we played France in 15, we played South Africa, and we just got through that game. And then we had Australia. Well, probably the hardest game was South Africa. Uh, 19, we, we, we'd we had a few problems with Ireland. They'd beaten us, I think, just before the World Cup, and, and we came out and smashed them. Played really well. Then it was about getting ourselves back in the right frame of mind. And I'm not you're not talking about a big drop, you're talking about one, two, three percent across the board of the team, and you're comfortable. You know, but you can't go into a test match, a World Cup semi final comfortable. England had come off a, a disastrous two fifteen World Cup. They was hungry as heck and they wanted us. But what happened to them the next week, they couldn't reproduce it because subconsciously they thought they'd done the job. It's not it's not a conscious thing, it's a subconscious thing. So you've got to work hard at those things as well. Yeah. So I am conscious, as I all time, that hindsight is the foresight of a gobshite. <laughs> yeah. So when you look back on that period now, what do you think you maybe could have done differently to have spotted those signs? Oh, look, I should have known that because you're always vulnerable straight after that. The, and, and I did, I did feel it in my bones. But at the same time, we had a couple of injuries, and one of them was a skipper. And I didn't want, I, we didn't know if he was going to play or not. And I didn't want the group going in. Shit, we've lost the skipper. You know, we, we coaches been in it, demanding, demanding. Now we lost the skipper. Like we, we can't win this. So you're trying to keep positive around that, and I think probably got too positive. And and. Uh, you know, it's a slippery slope. Explain too positive. Well, you know, we were in the right space, boys. We we're ready to go, you know, uh, knowing if Rito wasn't there, then we'd lost a big chunk of who we are. And they had a lot of belief in this cup, you know, he's an important part of the cog. So you're trying to, I wouldn't, don't want to use the word bullshit to make them feel good, but you're putting them in a place where, you know, well, Reedy's not here, but we're still okay. We, we're ready to, you know, coach says we're ready to go, we're ready to go. But probably in hindsight, I might have been better of just, if he's not there, then he's not there, they'll, they'll cope with that and let's be really focused on being demanding and let's set that attitude where we're going to take this game rather than wait for it to happen. Like England came out and took the game. We waited and got sm- you know, smack, 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 oh shit, now we better start now because this is, this is not what's meant to be happening. Yeah, it's very interesting getting the line right, isn't it, between building them up and mm. realism. And I think you can just never beat authenticity, can you? So even if as a coach you're having some slight concerns, is it ever a bad thing to say to the guys, look, this is the situation we're in? No, no it's not a bad thing. But you know, I think like when you look at that week, you know, it irks me, but when I look at the whole time that what are 170, 107 test matches as head coach, you know, we got most of those weeks right. So can I keep giving myself an uppercut? Yeah, I probably can, but you know, get over it, Stephen. How harsh are you on yourself? Yeah, pretty harsh, yeah. Does it benefit you? Sometimes, but not now, now that I've finished coaching. It doesn't benefit me to keep still beating myself up over it. Like, I can't change it. I can't say, Eddie, can we replay that game? Hey, World Rugby, can we go back and have that week again so we can fix it? So you, you do have to get over it. You know, you got to put your big boy pants on and get on with it. And I've heard you, that you speak about you have an alter ego. Sometimes it comes out, I can't remember the name you gave your alter ego when you get hyper-competitive. Oh, Stanley. Stanley. Uh, yeah, I didn't give it. The, my wife and uh, a couple of friends gave me that <laughs> for Stanley. Yeah, Stanley comes out because he just, he just becomes a bulldozer and there's no care, there's no love. He just charges, well, I'm wanting, we're playing cards, whatever it is. Yeah. And, what, and what often tempts Stanley out? What, what are the circumstances where that happens? Uh, ego and pride because you want to win. You know, like your pride is the biggest stumbling block in the world because it doesn't allow you to to admit your mistakes. It doesn't allow you to lose, Um, you know, and it's just another word for ego, really. So your ego, we all have an ego um, and we just got to master it. And when your pride 
becomes a problem, um, you, you don't master it, so it gets in the way, I guess. And yeah, so then Stanley comes out; he's just charging. <laughs> and does did Stanley does Stanley only come out playing cards with the family or doing stuff, or did he also come out in your coaching career? Well, I as think well? I think Stanley came out, and you know, in the second year with that Canterbury team that I was talking about in two fifteen, um, Lions year, I think Stanley came out then, but we didn't have a name for for it back then. Stanley's reasonably new. It's probably coming out more since I haven't got that avenue to be competitive. Yeah, but we, we've got him under control now. See, but most the, of the time. <laughs> so, I mean, that's something I can identify with, as I'm sure a lot of our listeners can. Like, how have you learned to control that side of your character? Well, you see the reaction it has on other people, you know, and no one wants to play cards because Stanley's going to come out. Right. So I want to play cards, so I can't, you know, I've got to check Stanley. And, you know, the kids don't want to play. Well, I want to play with the kids, so, you know, I've got to allow them to win occasionally. You know, that, that, that's what happens. You see the reaction of what you're doing to other people. Like, I'm reasonably sharp-tongued and and um, it would be quite often people would say, oh, you know, he likes last word Steve. And I'll go, well, it's because I can think of the last word. However, I've come to understand that it's not a bad thing sometimes. Okay, well, you can have that and walk away from it because early doors I, I probably punished, hurt uh, people and not necessarily because I wanted to but because of what I, you know, just to win that, you know, that, that banter conversation. The reason why that's interesting is because obviously, you know, you create these really fascinating and winning cultures with your rugby teams. But where you can't control is is outside factors. So, mm. you know, you've spoken about your players coping with external perception. I wonder how you coped with external criticism. I'm thinking mainly from the media and, you know, a lot of people listening to this won't be in the position you're in, but they will feel judged and challenged by other people. What advice would you offer them? Yeah, look, I think... Uh, None of us like to be judged in a negative way. Like we're all pretty happy to pick up the the positive judgment. Yeah. But we certainly it, it hurts when you get uh, the negative stuff. But you've got to come to understand that you're doing the best you can. If you can look in the mirror and say, "Look, I've done the best I can here. I've been honest. I've, I've tried my ass off. Is there anything else I could be doing? No. Uh, do these people know all the circumstances?" No, most of them don't. Uh, are they hurting because they're not getting what they want, which is a team winning or whatever it may be? Yes, probably. So you just forgive them and move on. Like it's because it's better for your own mental health. Um, people, you know, I'd like have perceptions because you win all the time. Well, you must be a great coach. They have the same perceptions if you're losing. Oh, you must be a shit coach. And I often have a chuckle to myself because I coach the team that has the most losses in a row at test level and I have a team that coaches most has won the most. So I'm a shit coach and a, a great coach. You know, so I'm just I just say to myself, We're well, just a coach, Steve. You know, so don't let it knock you and and uh, like you know where you wanna go. And and if you're taking the your group with you and they wanna come there too then eventually you'll turn it around. You won't, like sport is so good because it doesn't let you win all the time. It just doesn't, no one can. So eventually you get a kick in the bum and as you said before, we, we learn a lot more from that because we go deeper because it hurts, there's adversity. Um, and you know, that was one of the things I always used to say to the boys, why do we have to lose to learn? Why can't we learn when we're winning? If we can do that, we can win more often. Because that's what we all want to do. Accepting that, we're still going to get beaten occasionally because some consciously we're going to get comfortable. And, and once you get comfortable, then you'll make mistakes. You know, you talking about high performance, like you compare yourself to a surgeon and he's going to do an operation on your knee. You, you don't want him getting comfortable. I want him doing the best job he can do on that knee. Yeah. And we would talk about that. And I'd say, boys, right, we're going in to do an operation here. 
you know, we, are we going in at 95 here or are we going in totally committed? And, um, you know, that's, that, that's part of high performance, isn't it? If you get comfortable, you're going to get punished. So what would you say you did judge your coaching success by? Because like you say, you've had the most losses and the most wins. So if I can just give you an example of when a coach gave us a really fascinating answer to this was when we sat down with Rob Baxter at Exeter Chiefs and he said it took him 10 years into his coaching to realise the most important question was, would I be happy for my son to be coached by me? What would you say your criteria I've, was? I've always had the same criteria from the day I started to the day I've, I finished coaching and it's the greatest pleasure I get is when I can get an athlete to achieve something that he or she wants to achieve and couldn't achieve until you came along and gave her a little help or him a little help. I get a real buzz out of that. I get a buzz out of you know, teams, individuals within teams being able to achieve what they're trying to do. And and you can do that at any level of coaching. And I, I, I was never ever worried about getting sacked because I knew, well, that's where I get my buzz from, so I'll just go back down to the local club and do it down there, you know. Brilliant. Yeah. And how much freedom in your setup is there for you? Are, you know, are you um, are you a control freak? Do you want to know everything that's happening at all times? Uh, I would say that I'm an empowerer, but um, when I first started, I was probably a control freak. Yeah. Because I think we all are, because we think that's what we have to be. And, we, and we're not trusting enough in uh, our own abilities to not want to know. But as time went on, I, I hopefully uh, others would say, uh, yeah, he, he would let us do our job. I'd be demanding though. And we had one mantra in the group, in the management group was, if you're gonna make a decision that's gonna have, or possibly could have, an effect on the performance on Saturday, I want to know about it before we introduce it. If it's not going to do that, then don't have to tell me. So I, I saw myself as the helicopter over the group. We had a leadership system that went coaches, which Fozzy drove, um, wellbeing, which Gilbert and Oka drove. We had uh, logistics and commercial, which Darren Shan drove, and then we had the players, the leaders group driven by whoever the captain was, that, you know, the two captains were basically Richie or, or Rita. So they got on and did their bit and yes you had moments where like for example um, Nick Gill's the uh, strength and conditioning coach and we're having trouble with Dan Carter in 215, he'd been pulling calf muscles for a couple of years. And and I've, I don't know. One day I just because I've got an interest in horses and I understand. Uh, a long time ago, an old trainer said to me, he "said son, just because they're biomechanically they're not, they don't have the right shaped legs. It doesn't stop them from running fast. It'll just stop them from being able to do that for a long time." And if you look at Dan, he biomechanically is a mess. And I thought, well, what if we took some weight off? And well, he wasn't fat, but so I asked him. I said, "Well, what weight were you, when, mate, when you when you weren't pulling your calf muscles?" And he said, "Oh, I'm, you know, 93, maybe." I said, "What are you now? 95?" And like he's doing the the jockey ads at 95, so there's no it's muscle, it's not yeah. fat. So I went to Gilly and we talked about it. And I said, "Why don't we take a couple of kilo off and see if you know?" Because we both agreed he biomechanically he wasn't great. Would that help? Well, we did, and he never pulled another calf muscle. So, you know, that that's your role at, as the helicopter is not to, not to get in the way, but to actually find solutions for some things and think about some problems that they probably don't have the time to think about. And so would you set quite strict rules then? Because that's the great thing about that is you're standing off and you're empowering your people. So are rules important so they they know exactly the parameters they're working to or not? I hate rules. Do you? I hate rules. I, expectations I like, but I don't like rules because they stop people from sometimes going where they should. And I often say rules are there to guide the brave and inhibit the foolish. 
Uh, Interesting. And, and when I, I'm working in Japan at the moment, and oof, it's a society that's got a lot of rules, and and it it does inhibit them, you know. And we're making some progress and getting some change there, but oh, it's like pulling teeth out of a chicken. Like what in particular in Japan have you challenged? You give me a glass, you're you're ranked higher than me in the in the pecking order, so I have to go down there with my glass. Right. You know, or you bow, I have to bow. Like, they're, they're beautiful cultural things that are all about respect and honour and they're great traditions, but they're getting in the way of progress because they're inhibiting me from being able to challenge you so we can get your idea on that table and we can smack it with a hammer and turn it into a great idea or say, well, actually, it's a shit idea, let's get rid of it. So, you know, well, I, I torment everybody because I'm meant to be at the top of the pecking order, so they're all trying to go low, so I'll go down here and yeah. make a joke of it and, yeah. and make it it's OK, um, understanding that it is, it, it is their culture and respecting it. But I, when we're in this environment, it's OK to be... Yeah. There'll okay. be people, though, listening to this where that, uh, that scares them a bit. They might be a business leader going, well, I, the rule is you come in at nine o'clock. The rule is you you don't work from home four days a week. The rule is, well, you'll sit together for lunch. You know, the, People often use rules to create culture. What would you say to those people? Well, you just repeat what you said. You use the word create culture. Yeah. I'd say they use rules to force the culture. And if they're forcing it, they don't have a culture. It's got to happen naturally. It's got to be something that we all own and we want to be responsible for. So you can't create something with a rule. You can only force something with a rule. And every rule will get broken. So then what? Now what are we going to do? We're breaking the rule. Like if you break an expectation, uh, well, we can live with that. We, we can, there'll be a consequence, but it's not the same as you bro, well, he's broken the rule. You're going to have to drop him or you're going to shoot him or whatever you have to do. I don't know. So... Yeah, I, I, personally, I, I'm about expectation. I expect you to live the values and, and the things that we've said we want to live. As yeah. a, you know, I want you to make decisions that are based around those things. I don't want to make a rule that's going to make you have to do that. But what I love about that as well is that allows people to fall occasionally without being punished or ostracised or demonised for it. Yeah. Well, we're all, we all fall. You know, like I, I, I see players and hu- like all human beings from time to time who want to be perfect. I've never seen, like I go to our guys all the time. And I go, tell me the best game you ever played, and he tells me, I said, right, hey, did you make any mistakes in that? Oh yeah. I said, well, there you go. So stop trying to chase something that no one is ever going to do because you're always human nature will say, oh, I could have done that better could have done this but just be satisfied that you're actually doing these things really really well and then what is it we can take out of that performance that we can keep and what is it that we can go away and grow and get better at what about people then that are they're in your group and you're allowing the culture to mold them into the people you want rather than the rules but they're just not getting it they're just not right how would you advise people to deal with that well again i think there's an old, old saying that we use, if you can't change the man, change the man. At some point, if they're not going to come with you, then that's not the place for you to be. And what did you employ to try and get people to come with you? Well, you try all the, the things we've been talking about, you know, give them opportunities to understand that this is what the expectations are of the team. You've sat through meetings, you've sat through one-on-ones, um, you know, well, I'll give you an example without um, Alfie Thomas, mm. probably the second best athlete I've ever coached. Superb athlete, you no know, behind Sonny Bill and he'd be next. When I first came to Wales, he wasn't a leader, but he was seen to be a leader by his peers. Because when, you know, I always find it ironic when people name captains or you're a leader and you know who the leaders are when the shit hits the fan and everyone goes, well, what are we doing? And it may not be looking at the captain. Well, they'd always look at Alfie. What are, what are, you going, what are we going to do, Alf? Anyway, Alf, um, he was in a, in a part of his life that you know, wasn't quite clear for him and he was drinking and 
you know, but he, he was like best physique you could ever see. So it was obviously training. But he, he'd come during the week and he wouldn't try, you know, he just didn't want to be better than anybody else or work harder than anybody. He didn't want to show, didn't want to bring his book and write things down. So we had a conversation, some Alpha, I've got to let you go. But the doors open, if you change, then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll look at bringing you back. And um, so he went and... You know, I just lost my best best athlete, yeah. and I'm hurt, and I'm thinking, God, I hope you change, man. And three weeks later, I got a ring from his coach, and he said, "Oh, look, you've got to have another. This guy's changed animal." So I said, "Okay, thanks." And I'm again, back to the same horse trainer that taught me about the legs. I'd once said to him, "Oh, that horse looks really fit. You better put him back into training because we used to graze him on the farm." And his son, you give me a yell when he's. He said, oh, why is that? And I said, oh, because he's bucking. I saw him bucking today. It looks real fresh. He said, well, you give me a ring and when he's bucking every day and I'll bring him back into work. So <laughs> I put the phone down and <laughs> thought, right, oh, if he's really serious, he's changed, you'll ring me back in, a, in another week's time to say, shit, I meant to, you come down. Which he did do. Then I sent Scott Johnson down to see him and Scotty had a chat to him and he came back and he said, oh, I think you need to talk to him. He seems to be on a different plane. And So we brought him in and sat there and we had a great conversation and I said, right, mate, I'll judge you from this day forth on the things that we've just talked about that we need from you. And he, you know, he went on to be one of the greats and, and um, captain the Lions, you know, and, and that was satisfying when you see him being successful because we tried to change him. We had to go right to the bottom of the well to do it, but we tried other things, but that's what I mean. If you can't change a man, you have to change him. So if he hadn't have changed, we wouldn't have got him back, but he did. And so you've got to be flexible enough in your thinking to be able to say, well, let's give him another go. Love if it. He's serious. Bang, we've got a great athlete out of it. We always like to talk about a specific moment on, um, on high performance and just delve into it a little bit more deeply. And often, you know, when it comes to the life that you've lived, it's about winning the trophies and the titles and all of that. But I'd really like to talk to you about the moment that you decided to to walk away. Because I think that that is a really interesting thing. We spend our lives being told, never quit, never never give up. You know, sometimes the best thing you can do is is to step away from something. Yeah, well, look, 20 years is, you don't get 20 years for murder, do you? So it's a long time. Um, and it's a long time without your family. Um Sorry. Don't apologise. Yeah, it's a long time without your family and, you know, you owe them something. Um, at some point the team needs you to allow them to try something different. Yeah. And you just know it's time. So pull the trigger and get out. I think, um, you know, the emotion around the family is... is totally understandable and I think sometimes it's only when you step back and you, you're you're in probably quite a reflective period of your life now where you look back on what happened I, and I think we can't have a conversation about your success without actually paying the respects to the you know the amazing blended family you've got and mm. how the people around you had to allow you to do what you did yeah well, that's right and you know you keep talking about them I'll keep crying so um I said that they they miss out I don't know how many birthdays you miss. Um, Tasha did a wonderful job trying to keep everybody together. And then you come back and you're in and you're out. And you, you know. So it's easy for me, not so easy for everybody else. So you're just you know, so grateful um, because we were allowed... Oh, well, I think we're in a great place as a family... Um, everybody's achieving the things they want to achieve. Um, they're all striving, I guess, to to be better and uh, within their own setups. And they're still some of them are still finding their own way, and that that's fine. Like that's life. But uh, as as a group, you know, we love and care about each other, and you can't ask for any more than that. 
Nice. Well, I'm so pleased to chat to you here in London where you get to have a bit of a break with the family. Yeah, no, it's so, going to be great. Before they get even louder outside, let's do this. Um, we finish with a few quick fires. The first one is the three non-negotiable behaviours that you and ideally the people around you would buy into. Honesty, loyalty and hard working. Very good. What's your greatest strength and your biggest weakness? My competitiveness is both of them. Your greatest strength is always your biggest weakness. How important is legacy to you? Uh, to me, I think, you know, what you leave behind is pretty important. What story you want, yeah, grandchildren to hear, massive. What advice would you give a teenage Steve just starting out? Uh, be mentally uh, more aware of how to use mental skills, uh, be a little bit more patient, um, uh, don't be in a rush to uh, think with certain parts of your body as opposed to your bigger head. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the final one is, um, for people that have listened to this, been a really fascinating conversation, it's the final question really that you'd like to leave with the answer ringing in their ears. What would you now say is your one golden rule for for living a high performance life? Oh, be the best version that you can be. Don't compromise yourself. Um, don't compromise your integrity. Uh, just because you think it's going to be something beneficial to you, it's got to be a bigger cause than you. Yeah, so try and uh, be vulnerable enough to not put your hand up when you don't know. Um, and, and you don't have to tell the world everything you know. Sometimes it's better to listen to what other people know. I love that. I think um, we've caught you in a really nice reflective period in your life and thank you very much for spending a bit of time with us sharing the things you've done and the thoughts you have from it. Yeah, thanks. It's been wonderful.